Hello, thank you for joining us for the May edition of Forage Focus. Today's show is going to be all about weeds in pastures and hay systems. How to identify them, how to control them. It'll be really exciting. Stay tuned. I'm your host, Christine Gelly, and today's guest for Forage Focus is the legendary Cliff Little. Cliff is the educator in Guernsey County for Agriculture and Natural Resources. Cliff, thank you for joining me on the show today. What keeps you busy in Guernsey County? Well, we're talking about weeds today. Yeah, that can keep you kind of busy, and I think we got some pretty unique weeds. Of course, they're more local in flavor, and those can change depending on where our, our viewers are at, but they could also become a, a problem in other areas of the state. So that's why we're going to talk about them today. Well, it is that time of year. People are getting ready to make hay and noticing the weeds that are present in their pastures. Uh, what are some of of the top weeds that we find people struggling with? Well, you know, weeds, when you think about weeds, if I were to come to your farm and take a look at some of your problem weeds, I'd probably say, well, yeah, that, that's a problem weed. And I, I'd be asking myself, why? Because you're gonna want to, the first thing you want to know about weeds, Christine, is how to control them. Right. And maybe you're contributing to the problem, in other words. Your so management. Find that source of the problem. If you don't address what's contributing to the problem, maybe it's overgrazing, maybe it's lack of fertility, if any, uh, maybe it's those winter feeding areas where nothing's grown on, so you have an opportunity for a weed to, to take hold. But you've got to take into consideration why the weed's there. So you've all been to a, a, an area or a pasture or a hay field where that manager's doing a super job that stands really thick. And what you find is those fields have fewer weeds. Management plays a role. So just the solution isn't always just eliminating the weed, it's attacking the problem that have put the weed there in the first place. So although today we're talking about a lot of different weeds, um, it's more than that in, in terms of controlling. You really have to find the real problem why they're there in the first place. It seems like the most common source of the problem in our area is lack of fertility. Would you agree? That does contribute for sure. And of course, this past winter, you couldn't help but be hard on grazing lands because we've came off the, the wettest year in Ohio history. So that's going to damage a lot of soil over the course of the winter. So we're likely to see weeds in places that we haven't seen weeds before, potentially new weeds that we're not familiar with uh, that could cause us severe issues while we're trying to manage, whether that's a new problem or a chronic problem. Before we select any control method, we really need to make sure we know what weed we're dealing with, right? That's right. And I mentioned before, as we, we look at that problem, that's one of the things and, and what contributed to that weed getting there. The other thing that you might walk up on, some of the weeds we're going to talk to you today about may not be life-threatening. In other words, weeds can be just weeds. They're taking up production, productive grass areas, for example, good legume cover uh, that you want to have there. They're reducing those grazable acreage, uh, but they can also be life-threatening. So the importance of a weed on a farm is unique to your place because you may be dealing with a weed or a tree that could potentially kill livestock down the road. So I haven't ranked them that way, but I've, I've given you a list here, and we're going to look at some of those in a little bit, that are are spreading fast and not all of them uh, are poisonous but a couple of them are that we will we'll talk about here but they concern me because they're taking up grazable land livestock don't uh, utilize these particular plants and so that's how I kind of uh, rank them today but I want you to remember that each time you get on a farm somebody's gonna place those weeds in a different ranking and many times you have multiple weeds. So we talk about an individual weed. Our first one here is knapweed, for example, we're going to talk about. But 
you may be dealing with two or three or four different weeds and what you call me out here to talk about is not the one you should be concerned about because you have another weed that may kill your livestock come August or something. Right. We have seen a lot of yeah. poisoning cases, which came down to, you know, not quite addressing the primary target, the one that might kill your livestock. So we're always accessible to come out and, and help our county folk do some of that ID and get the right weeds treated that are the priority. So let's dive into some of let's those. Let's do that. Our so, first one. Napweed, right. And so Christine and I in Southeast Ohio are part of a, a program here to help support the control of this particular weed and several of the other plants we're going to talk about here in the segment, I guess, or next segment. But spotted napweed is relatively new on the scene in Ohio, at least at the population that we have it today. So a lot of the weeds that you'll hear about and see about in this program, we've already talked about probably in the Beef Cattle Newsletter, and that's a great archive of historical documents that you can tap into. Stan Smith in Fairfield County maintains that newsletter, and you can search that and find this weed, for example, spotted knapweed. And I would say virtually everyone in Ohio that does any traveling has driven by this blossoming flower in July and August with this beautiful purple blossom. It's readily seen along the state route in inner states of Ohio, particularly in eastern Ohio, come July and August. The problem with this weed, although it's been in the North American continent now for about a hundred years, is, well, type it in. I mean, I, I really don't need to talk to you much about it. <laughs> if you just type in the word spotted knapweed on the internet, you're going to see that western part of the United States they're spending a lot of money to try to keep this under control. Why is it such a threat? Is it poisonous? Is it just crowding? It takes over. So, and by the way, there are also examples of people mob grazing this, forcing livestock to graze it. So you don't rule that out. I don't think it's for everybody. Uh, but this plant will take over a pasture, can even take over a hay field. It's a very prolific seeder. It's a short-term perennial, about four years, and, and produces a lot of seeds, which are easily transported. This stuff I've even seen growing in lawns. So yeah, I've seen it too. Blossoming at that height. Something that's unique about this weed, I think a lot of people don't see it in year one because it kind of acts like a biennial in that it doesn't yes. flower the first year. But it's it's a perennial, not necessarily a biennial. But that first year, it's just the rosette, so a lot of people don't notice it at all the first year they have it. All you need to do, though, is when you see these blossoms now, is stop and look. You'll see that you've never seen anything like it before uh, because it is quite unique. Now, there's some pictures here of some leaves, Christine, and you can see that in the spring when it is bolting, Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of look-alikes. Sure there are. It can be confused for chicory. It can be confused for Canada thistle. Uh, some people even drive them by real fast think it's red clover because the color is similar. They do. Yeah. So, but if you look at it, take one out of the ground and take a look. It, it is distinctly different. The flower is different. The leaves are different. It doesn't have any pokes or spines, so you know it's not Canada thistle. The leaves aren't right for it to be chicory. The flowers are completely different. There's no other plant that has this combination of features. So this is one. When you start to see spotted knapweed coming in, and most of the time you see it coming in from along the roads, you're going to want to start to work on it right away. And so you, I've expressed that you can't really mow it out. You can't mow it frequently enough uh, to keep it out of a pasture or a field. So you'll have to use a chemical herbicide to control it. Uh, and there are are probably a handful of unrestricted use products that you could use to, to control it. Call your local extension office, kind of go over that list of products. What you need to do when you're thinking about using a herbicide is look at the restrictions first. Do I, am I marketing livestock? Are they going to slaughter? Um, will I need to be grazing that right away or cutting it for hay or silage? Will I want to be replanting that field soon? All these are going to make a difference in what herbicide you select. Uh, replanting restrictions could be several months, depending 
depending on what herbicide you select to use. Right, and that's going to go for all herbicides and all types of weed treatments. You always want to make sure you're checking the label, selecting the right herbicide for your situation. So let's right. move into some other weeds that we might see. Poison hemlock. Um, we do see more of that now in southeastern Ohio. We saw some it, driving over here today, didn't we? We did, a biennial, and if you notice it, it's quite prevalent along ditches and roadways and streams, uh, likes wet areas, and this is the most poisonous plant that we'll talk about today. Um, and it can be poisonous, wet or dry, in hay, silage, or forages. We don't fortunately find a lot of animals that are poisoned right now in eastern Ohio from it, which is surprising to me. But it is certainly one that I wouldn't want on my farm. I'd want to start to get it under control because if you haven't seen it, it can take over massive areas. I think the next picture shows how large this plant actually gets. Some people can confuse this at first for Queen Anne's lace, but this is significantly larger. There are some differences. So if you see something similar to this, you know it's not Queen Anne's lace, it's poison hemlock. Now don't go out and try to pull it barehanded though because this can give you a skin rash, it right? It does. Some of these plants do give, uh, oh, well, even uh, spotted knapweed can give some people some rashes. But yeah, this one will as well. Uh, there are other related plants like parsnip that'll do that. But this looks like a Queen Anne's lace, I call it on steroids, right? Yeah. Let's go to the next one and compare the flowers between the two. So there's a little bit of a difference for comparing the two flowers, but the biggest giveaway is that size. It is, the size and the purplish colored stem mm -hmm. of poison hemlock as well. Let's go ahead, we gotta move on pretty quick based on time here. This is a new one. Ooh, that looks ugly to me. I would not wanna bite that if I was a cow, sheep, goat. I know you worked in Tennessee. They had this there. Oh yes, we did. It was a challenge because this is spiny amaranth and it will bloom, flower, grow at the height below the mower deck. Isn't that cool? This little pigweed relative is nasty. These thorns on this thing are glass-like, so you don't really see them. First time you reach down to pull it, though, you will remember this pigweed. Certainly. And what it'll do is it tends to take over in those winter feeding areas, barn lots, areas where you have a lot of exposed ground. And uh, look at the seeds on this. This picture I took in June, by the end of June, this entire area up around the barn lot was covered in spiny amaranth and the cattle won't get near it. Well, I don't blame them. Yeah. Can you imagine taking a bite of that? Not hard to control, but why not hop on it before it goes out to seed? Uh, you're not going to get it under control by doing nothing or mowing and from that barn lot, it could likely spread into your hay fields. Let's talk about another one that has pokey spines. We got a couple more that are pokey and I just these weeds are a pain whether you're an animal or you're a manager. Canada thistle. I guess it's everybody's least favorite, right? I mean, it's it's been around an awful long time, perennial weed that is a, a pain and certainly nasty to have in those pasture and hay fields as well. Um, because of that, you know, if you get that right when it's starting to form that bud, you'll get that herbicide translocated when it's actively growing. You, we have some good products that can work for you to control this. Another one that we've got is horse nettle. We, I've actually had a flock of sheep, that would be one of my co-workers, uh, that were poisoned by this particular plant. And I mentioned the time of year, well it happened to be in August, and so the vet came in, diagnosed a poisoning, I was asked to find out what weed it was. And there was no forage left in August, so the sheep were reaching in and eating these berries off a of horse nettle, which is a member of the nightshade family, and it killed a lot of the, his ewes. Oof. That's the reason why weed ID is certainly important. Right. We are running out of time to cover more of these weeds, but there are some excellent resources that you can consult. Cliff, if you want to skip forward a couple slides, we'll share the websites for the beef team, the sheep team, and also the forages website from OSU. These are all great websites to go to and get some additional information. You can also contact Cliff or I by the information available on the screens uh, throughout this presentation. Stay tuned for our next segment that's going to cover woody perennials.